Good afternoon. Happy Monday. Good afternoon to everyone. It's uh, quite a full briefing room. I'm joking with my colleague that I have a uh, hard out today at 5 p.m. So we'll uh, <laughs> make good use of our time. Uh, just one, uh, one announcement at the top, and then we'll turn to your questions. Uh, the United States took further action today, concurrently with the United Kingdom and the European Union, to promote accountability for the Iranian regime's human rights abuses by imposing sanctions on 10 additional Iranian individuals, including Iran's Deputy Minister of Intelligence and, and key commanders in the Iran Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, as well as one additional Iranian entity. Today's action is the latest of numerous tranches of sanctions made in close consultation with our allies and partners and aimed at Iranian individuals and entities connected to Iranian authorities' cruel and violent crackdown against peaceful protesters. In addition, we applaud our allies and partners, including the United Kingdom, members of the European Union, Canada, Australia, and others, who also continue to sanction Iranian authorities and entities involved and complicit in human rights abuses and in Iran's supply of weapons to Russia for use in the Kremlin's brutal war against Ukraine. Today, we are united with our allies and partners in the need to confront Iran's leadership for its human rights abuses and destabilizing activities, which should alarm the entire world. With that, turn to your questions. Uh, I was late, so I'll allow uh, uh, Very magnanimous of you. Uh, sure. I have nothing if not. And nothing, I've, I've always said that about you, Matt. <laughs> uh, I think people, people want to listen to so the Can I start with you, Sure. Um, the, um, um, the, the withdrawal of Eritrean troops, there's the, uh, the call um, over the weekend with uh, Prime Minister Abiy. Uh, to what extent is this verified that this is a withdrawal? Um, do you expect it to be permanent? Expect it as in, do you acknowledge that it's, it's permanent? Uh, this was a subject of the call with the Prime Minister over the weekend. As you know, they had an opportunity to speak on January 21st. They spoke uh, of numerous elements, but that included the ongoing withdrawal of Eritrean troops from northern Ethiopia. Uh, the Secretary welcomed this development, uh, noting that it was a key to secure, securing a sustainable peace in northern Ethiopia, and he urged access for international human rights monitors. Uh, the Secretary also affirmed the commitment of the United States to support the AU-led peace process in northern Ethiopia. Uh, they also discussed the need to bring an end to ongoing instability in the Oromia uh, region of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, we do applaud the continued steady progress towards implementing uh, the key elements of the cessation of hostilities agreement that was reached a number of months ago, uh, as well as the positive role uh, of the AU's Joint Monitoring, Verification, and Compliance uh, team. When it comes to Eritrea, as I mentioned before, Sean, we are aware that Eritrean forces are beginning uh, to withdraw from Ethiopia. Uh, we reiterate the call that you've heard consistently from us, including the call that was included uh, in the communique that emanated from uh, the, the talks in South Africa uh, for the withdrawal of all foreign forces. Um, we uh, reiterate the call, the call for the complete withdrawal in line with that November uh, 12th uh, Nairobi agreement as well. Uh, the departure of Eritrean and other forces is crucial, as I said before, to achieving uh, lasting peace, securing full humanitarian access, and ensuring the territorial integrity of uh, Ethiopia, even as uh, we continue to see positive signs, including the ongoing withdrawal of uh, Eritrean forces. We are concerned by reports that Eritrean forces have committed human rights abuses against civilians, and we continue to and continue to impede the delivery of much-needed humanitarian assistance. Uh, we call on the governments of Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, to investigate these reports and to hold uh, those responsible to account. Uh, we also call on the government of Ethiopia to fulfill its commitment to grant full access uh, to international human rights monitors. Sure. Just follow up a couple of things. The the um, the abuses that you're talking about. You're talking about in the past, not, not currently. That's correct. Right? That's correct. Control. That's correct. Um, two things. Have, as far as you know, has there been any contact with the Eritreans? Obviously, the U.S. has a different relationship there. And, of course, there are sanctions that were imposed on Eritrea um, in the course of the war. Will those, not today, I'm sure, but will, yep. those, will those be lifted in some sense? Uh, for this? In terms of our uh, any dialogue with Eritrea, we, of course, do have an embassy in Asmara. Uh, it is a relationship that... Um, is, uh, to put it lightly, strained. Uh, of course, we have uh, the means by which to convey messages uh, to counterparts in Asmara. Sometimes delivering those message public messages publicly is the most effective means by which to do that, but we do have an embassy there. Um, when it comes to the sanctions that are on Eritrean officials, 
uh, you were right that there are a number of accountability mechanisms that uh, some of which uh, were devised and announced in the course of uh, this civil war in Ethiopia that we hope is finally coming to an end. One of those was the executive order that this administration devised and uh, President Biden announced uh, some number of months ago. Eritrean forces uh, have been subject to its provisions uh, because of their activity during the course uh, of this conflict. If this continues, uh, if we continue to see uh, positive momentum, we of course will uh, take that into account. We will take into account uh, everything we see, the good, the bad, uh, as we evaluate the next steps and determine uh, whether any additional accountability measures are warranted or, uh, to the contrary, uh, if certain sanctions that are in place uh, no longer have um, a, a basis uh, in that executive order. Uh, yeah, Mark. Um, Ned, can you talk a little bit about this whole saga around the tanks in Europe? And there seems to be a lot of back and forth and even like almost a, a dispute about, um, you know, Germany doesn't want to send the tanks independently. You guys are saying it's their sovereign decision, but they want the, they seem to want the shield of uh, allies. So what can the administration do to support that process? And um, the administration has uh, made the effort to keep NATO unified, and this seems to be a bit of an emerging clash. Um, how does the Biden administration feel about this in Europe? Uh, first, let me let me take the second part of your uh, question first. Uh, at virtually every step of Russia's war against Ukraine, we've heard uh, these prognostications or predictions that the transatlantic u unity that we've marshaled and maintained is fraying at the seams, it's coming apart. In fact, we heard that even before uh, the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th. Uh, at every step of the way, those predictions have proved to be uh, premature and just uh, flat out wrong. Uh, you, let me just give you one example. Look at what came out of the latest convening of uh, the Defense Contact Group that uh, Secretary of Defense Austin and Chairman Milley uh, attended last week. And you saw uh, announcements, new announcements, from any number of allies and partners that speak to the tremendous amount uh, of not only unity, but determination from countries around the world to continue to stick with it. Uh, France and Germany and the UK, they've all donated air defense systems to Ukraine. Uh, that includes from Germany, uh, an, uh, a, uh, a Patriot battery. The Netherlands is donating a Patriot, uh, Patriot missiles and launchers and training. Canada has procured an ASAM system and associated munitions for Ukraine. Uh, the UK, of course, announced the provision of uh, Challenger 2 tanks for Ukraine. Sweden announced it's donating uh, CV-90 infantry fighting vehicles, an additional donation soon of Archer howitzers. Denmark, Latvia, uh, other countries all announced new provision of support to Ukraine in the context of uh, the Defense Contact Group, and that was just last week. Oh, and I should be, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we also announced $2.5 billion uh, of our own security assistance. Yes. All of that lacks tanks, and that's the urgent request from the Ukrainians. So, like, great cooperation and agreement on all of those, but they say this is the most urgent one, So you guys seem to tanks, have lacked. tanks. We have taken steps over the course of many months, including over the summer, uh, to see to it that partners are in a position to provide tanks to Ukraine. Ukraine has has tanks. Uh, I don't want to leave you with the misimpression uh, that Ukraine doesn't have tanks. Ukraine has hundreds uh, of tanks. Uh, so point A, uh, when it comes to are any- Are saying their request is irrational when it, when it When it comes to any particular capability, you've heard us say this before and you actually uh, summed, it, summed it up. This is a sovereign decision on the part of each country to decide what types of security assistance uh, to provide, what they're in a position to provide. We applaud all of our allies and partners for what they have done so far. And I just recounted some of that, that we've heard uh, over the past 72 hours or so. Uh, we've previously, when it comes to Germany, uh, applauded its announcements that they'll send Ukraine infantry fighting vehicles, ML MLRS systems, air defense capabilities, including the IRST air defense system, and, as I mentioned before, a Patriot missile battery. We also applaud the decision by the UK, as I mentioned before, to send these Challenger tanks to Ukraine. Um, 
We will continue to do our part to provide Ukraine with what it needs. I mentioned our latest uh, provision of security assistance that we announced uh, on Thursday and Friday. Uh, that was the 30th drawdown of so-called presidential drawdown authority, 30 times now. Uh, we have announced um, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of security assistance uh, to Ukraine. And on Friday, we announced that we'll provide more than 500 armored vehicles uh, to Ukraine, in addition to the Bradley fighting vehicles that we've previously announced. But what role I, is I see Ukraine you with, in the... I see you uh, having a follow-up question. I, I suspected you would go there. Uh, our, our role there will be con to continue to speak with our Ukrainian partners, uh, to speak with our allies, including in the context of, context of NATO, including in the context of the Defense Contact Group, to determine uh, the needs of uh, the Ukrainian fighters, uh, and also what members of this coalition of some 50 countries are in a position to provide. We are not going to be prescriptive. Uh, the only thing that we're continuing to prescribe uh, is that President Putin's aggression will be continue to be a strategic failure. Uh, we are going to provide Ukraine with what it needs uh, to take on the battle that it's facing at any given moment. We can say that until we're blue in the face, but more importantly, we can continue to demonstrate that. And I think you see that with the success that our Ukrainian partners have had on the battlefield, uh, including uh, with the security assistance that we've provided and some 50 other countries around the world have provided. Yes, in the back. In the meantime, in, 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 in the back, yes, 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 please. This is Deutsche Welle for yes. follow-up of this. My question, um, what uh, impact does uh, Germany's hesitation have on the German-American relationship when it comes to not sending tanks now? Question number one, and Poland says that they want to send Leopards uh, to Ukraine without the permit of Germany. Would uh, Secretary Blinken uh, support that decision? These are questions for Germany, these are questions for Poland. In some cases, these are questions that uh, our German allies will need to uh, discuss with uh, our uh, shared allies. And my impression, having seen uh, headlines that are just emerging, is that we may be hearing more from our German allies uh, in the coming hours and the coming days. But I will say, Germany is a stalwart ally across the board, including in the context of the security assistance that it has provided uh, to Ukraine. I've already mentioned some of the systems that Germany has provided, the IRIS-T system, uh, the MLRS systems, uh, the Patriot missile battery, uh, not to mention everything else that Germany has spoken to over the past 11 months or so. If you would mention these systems and the amount of security assistance that Germany uh, has to date provided on February 23rd of last year, I think there would have been a lot of people around the world who may not have believed you. Uh, Germany has stepped up. Germany has stepped up uh, in a big way. Uh, it has provided uh, quantity, but it, it has also provided capabilities that our Ukrainian partners need. Uh, there is no doubt in our mind that Germany is a reliable ally on this front and on every front. That, that uh, Poland? I just want to follow up. Is it, is it on this? Is it on this? Yeah, uh, on, on, this, on this issue. You know, in the meantime, you are really pressuring Germany to, to send the leopard tanks, right? Uh, Said, I, I just went to some length to say that to say that it is a sovereign decision of, of each of each country. A lot of pressure to send the leopard tank. Why not send the A1M1 uh, apron? Uh, Why not? It's the best tank in the world. Said, this is something that our uh, colleagues at the Department of Defense have, have spoken to. Uh, I don't want to uh, compare apples and oranges, and I think the comparison uh, of these two systems as apples and oranges may understate the differences that, that we're talking about here. Let me just say that we are in direct, regular communication with our Ukrainian partners. We'll continue to provide them with what they need to defend themselves, given uh, the nature of the battle that they are confronting at any given moment. Now, the other point I should make, and I made this to Humaira, is that we've already helped our Ukrainian partners to obtain tanks. Uh, we have worked with them to obtain former Soviet-made and Russian-made tanks that they're already trained on, they know how to use, they can put to use right away, they can repair them, they can keep them operational, and most importantly, they can be effective with them. Uh, we also announced, uh, as I said before, on Friday, an assistance package that included 500 additional armed vehicles, in addition uh, to the Bradley fighting vehicles that we announced for the first time a couple, oh, a couple oh, weeks ago. Follow up, Poland. Just a quick follow up. I, 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 although, I understand. Although, you know, we have not really seen any great tank battles in this war. 
we have seen that these tanks are being used as artillery. I mean, what? Maybe you could supplement that, send them some fancy artillery or something. <laughs> you you are basically describing what we're already doing. Yes. Yeah, that follow up, uh, yeah, up follow up. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So uh, uh, a TVN Warner Bros. discovery from Poland. So uh, uh, it's uh, obviously uh, a question about uh, Poland's role here. So Poland wants to build, and it's a quote from the Prime Minister, at least a small coalition of countries that would send leopards to Ukraine. Would you diplomatically uh, help? build such a coalition so that Poland and other countries in the region could send those leopards to Ukraine? Uh, we have uh, marshaled, built, led a coalition of countries, of 50 countries, uh, that uh, is for over the course of the better part of a year has provided billions and billions of dollars worth of security assistance to Ukraine. And we keep talking about security assistance because that's where the, the questions are coming. But I would be remiss not to mention the economic assistance, the humanitarian assistance uh, that countries around the world have uh, also provided. I don't want to suggest that security assistance is the only form of assistance our Ukrainian partners need. They need all of it, uh, and they need it from as many countries uh, as are positioned to provide it. Uh, so to answer your question, there is an extant coalition. Uh, the United States has uh, helped to put this together, helped to lead it. We'll continue to do that. How about Leopard Coalition? Uh, yeah. To provide we, tanks. Let, let, let me just make uh, a quick point. We don't have uh, Leopard tanks, as I, as I think you know. This is a question for uh, countries in Europe that, that do have them. Uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey. Say this, say any, okay, just go ahead. Just to understand your position on this. We're not questioning about the unity. That's clear that part has been established, and thank you for that. The question is about the leadership. Germany says the U.S. needs to lead by providing with one single album so we can release all the levels. Alex, I, really I, 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 think, I think oftentimes people in this room put words into my mouth. I think you might be putting words into the mouths of uh, German uh, officials. I'm not sure I've heard that uh, from our from our German allies. Yes. Uh, yes. How do you respond on this? Uh, uh, are you asking a question on this? No, nothing. Okay. Well, let, let's see. let's let's try and move on in a couple in a minute. But anything else on this, Kylie? Prime, or maybe yesterday, but today or yesterday, the Polish Prime Minister um, made a remark saying that they're going to try and put together a coalition of European countries that would like to send these leopard tanks, and essentially made. Um, the argument that they might do it without getting the approval of Germany. Would the U.S. support those countries in doing that if Germany doesn't give them the green light? This is, this is not a, a question for us. This is a question for our German allies. This is a question for our allies that, that have so these systems. Would it be harmful to the NATO coalition uh, if they uh, did that? Again, an indispensable element of uh, the effectiveness that our Ukrainian partners have had uh, has been the unity uh, the consensus, the unanimity uh, that we've seen within uh, this broad coalition, whether it's within NATO, whether it's within uh, this grouping of some 50 odd countries that are providing security assistance to Ukraine. Of course, we put a premium on maintaining uh, that consensus and that cooperation and that close coordination, but that's not a question for us. That's a question for uh, our, our allies and partners with these particular. So, so if you were going to uh, say you, you guys would actually prefer unanimity, or you know you would want unanimity. Uh, we, uh, of course, it has been indispensable to the success. Uh, and I'm not speaking to the provision of a system. I'm speaking. And it would uh, be indispensable on this occasion as well. Uh, I am speaking in terms of uh, the indispensability of uh, the consensus, the coordination, the consultation uh, that we have achieved and maintained uh, with uh, partners around the world in support of Ukraine. That's that's yeah. my point. Just uh, anything, that, we'll take one yes, more question on this. You yes, seem particularly eager. On the yes. peace side of these tanks, because I know uh, Putin has been uh, talking about if these tanks were to be given, you know, nuclear war could have started. So let's see if we could change the subject to a little bit to the peace side of it. Is it true that Ukraine has asked China uh, to help out in this issue and uh, maybe uh, bring about some peaceful resolve to this whole thing, or no? Th that's a better question for our Ukrainian partners. I can say that we are looking to all countries around the world that have relations with Russia, including uh, a relationship with Russia that we certainly don't have, and many of our closest partners uh, in NATO and in the broader international community don't have, to use uh, their voice 
to use their pool, to use their leverage uh, to encourage President Putin to put an end to this brutal war. China is a country that, perhaps more so than any other country, has leverage with Russia, political leverage, economic leverage, um, that we would like to see the PRC use to uh, bring about an end to needless bloodshed, an end to civilian harm, suffering, destruction, and, by the way, to hold up the very principles that the PRC, over the course of many decades now, has at least maintained that they hold dear. Uh, whether it's in the United Nations system, whether it's in uh, any number of international fora, we've heard from the PRC over the course of decades an emphasis on state sovereignty, uh, an emphasis uh, on uh, the rules-based international order, an emphasis on uh, the UN Charter uh, by tacitly, and in some cases explicitly, uh, supporting Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they are eroding their standing on all of those issues. Uh, they are taking actions that counteract uh, everything they have said that they believe in. And then uh, one question on India. India. Uh, we'll, we'll come back. Uh, China? Go, go ahead, Russia. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a lunch in uh, North Korea together. Uh, the head of Russia's mercenary partner group sent a message of objection to the White House, reporting the armed deal between North Korea and the Wagner group, announced by the White House last week. And they asked what the crime was. What is the State Department's position on the objection of the Wagner group? Well, I, I would note that uh, this letter from Mr. Prigozhin to uh, my colleague at the White House uh, came uh, precisely in the aftermath of uh, the White House declassifying additional information regarding uh, the Wagner Group's activities uh, inside Ukraine, uh, the Wagner Group's uh, the support that is receiving from uh, the DPRK, uh, not to mention the uh, a broader discussion about the destabilizing influence that the Wagner Group is having, not only in Ukraine, uh, but in other parts of the world, including in parts of uh, Africa. Uh, so we've gone to great lengths uh, to explain our concerns uh, with uh, the Wagner Group. We have declassified information. We've declassified uh, imagery. We've spoken uh, to our concerns in the Ukrainian context and the broader context. Uh, and I think I'll let those comments speak for themselves. Uh, regarding UN Security Council sanctions, if China and Russia oppose sanctions against the uh, Wagner groups, will the U.S. Uh, pursue its own sanctions? Uh, yes, and we are. Uh, what the White House noted uh, last week is that we are imposing additional uh, designations, uh, using additional authorities to pursue uh, the Wagner Group. This is uh, a group that uh, for quite some time uh, has been subject to U.S. sanctions. Uh, we imposed further sanctions in March of 2022 uh, related to uh, Mr. Prigozhin's funding of the Internet Research Agency, uh, which he uses to propagate uh, his global influence operation. So we are going to use every appropriate tool uh, to pursue the Wagner Group, to attempt to counter uh, its destabilizing actions, its destabilizing influence, again, uh, in the Ukrainian context and, and more broadly as well. And then uh, will you engage in diplomatic cooperation with South Korea on these uh, matters, these issues? On, on, on this particular issue? Yeah. Uh, it, it is fair to say that, uh, of course, we have uh, the closest of uh, relations with our South Korean ally. Uh, there is a nexus to the DPRK uh, in this case, given the provision of uh, arms uh, and other military wares from the DPRK to uh, Wagner uh, entities for use in Ukraine. Uh, we routinely discuss with our partners in the ROK uh, the broad array uh, of threats and challenges we face from the DPRK. Uh, most frequently, uh, the challenge uh, we face from its nuclear weapons program, its ballistic missile program, but uh, we've spoken too to uh, its activities in the cyber realm, uh, to money laundering, to uh, criminal activities, and yes, uh, to its support for 
uh, what Russia is perpetrating on the people of Ukraine. Uh, I need to move around to, yes, let's get everyone. How do you respond to Erdogan? Uh, he said today that uh, Sweden cannot count anymore on Turkey to join NATO. Well, uh, you know our position on Finland and Sweden uh, and uh, their NATO accession. Uh, you've heard this from the administration. You've heard this from members of Congress. Uh, we strongly support their NATO candidacies. Uh, Finland and Sweden are ready to join the alliance. They are ready to join the alliance uh, because of uh, their military capabili capabilities. Uh, the long-standing security partnership that we have with uh, Finland and Sweden that now goes back decades. Uh, we exercise together, we cooperate together, uh, we share information together, but uh, they're also ready to join the alliance because these are highly developed democracies. Um, when it comes to what we've seen in, in recent days, um, we support freedom of association, the right of peaceful assembly, uh, as elements of any democracy. Uh, but just as uh, the Swedish prime minister said, um, burning books that are holy to many is a deeply uh, disrespectful act. Uh, and he made the point that what is legal is not necessarily appropriate. We have a saying uh, in this country, uh, something can be lawful but awful. Uh, I think in this case, what we've seen in the, in the context of, of Sweden uh, falls into that category. Um, we are also cognizant of the fact that those who may be behind uh, what has taken place in, in Sweden uh, may be engaging in an intentional effort uh, to try to weaken uh, unity uh, across the Atlantic and uh, within uh, and among our uh, European allies uh, and partners. We feel that Finland and Sweden are uh, ready to be NATO allies. Uh, we've voiced that consistently, uh, but ultimately this is a uh, decision and a consensus that uh, Finland and Sweden are going to have to reach uh, with Turkey. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's stay on the same subject and come back. Sure. Um, so the United States, we all know that said that it applies to extremism in all these forms around the world, and that might be true, but the um, from so many Muslim countries and international organizations alike, even the United Nations, they have come out condemning <laughs> this extremist behavior. So does the United States condemn this behavior because it is going to send a critically a signal to the whole world why there's no Muslim world. There is no condemnation from the United States. It's kind of a you know, really hot message that the reaction might be a bit softer than expected. So a, a couple of things, as I said before, we support uh, freedom of association and the right of peaceful assembly as elements in any democracy. And one of the reasons Finland and Sweden are ready to join NATO is because they are advanced democracies. Uh, we have we have had our own challenges along these lines in, in this country. Uh, there was a, a famous incident uh, not so long ago in, in this country uh, that uh, would fall in the uh, under the same terms, something that may be legal, uh, but that is profoundly disres disrespectful, uh, that is profoundly, uh, we might think, inappropriate, profoundly incendiary, something that is lawful, but uh, in this case, awful. Uh, it is up to Sweden, it is up to Finland uh, to interpret and to enforce their own laws, just as it is up to us in this country uh, to interpret and enforce our own laws when we're confronted uh, with something that a provocateur uh, might wish to take on. So in that, in that scenario then, what people in the United States from condemning this act? Because I'm not trying to extract some kind of a statement from you, but what's the thought process at the State Department to condemn this or not? Because even the United Nations have come out and condemned it. Well, uh, again, we, no one here is defending uh, what happened. Uh, and in fact, you've heard the very same thing from uh, senior Swedish authorities. Uh, we are cognizant, though, that within democracies, there is freedom of association, there is freedom of uh, expression within that freedom uh, that uh, gives people uh, the right to undertake actions that uh, may be disrespectful, they may be repugnant, uh, that may be disgusting. I, I think uh, all of those descriptors apply to what we've seen here. It's what we've heard uh, from our Swedish partners as well. No, just to follow up on that, what is the U.S. assessment on Erdogan's specific comments, though? Like, do you think 
is the U.S. assessment that he's closing the door or he's just very angry with what happened over the weekend and this is a temporary thing? I, I wouldn't want to interpret it, interpret uh, President Erdogan's comments uh, from here. It's not uh, interpretation. What do you guys understand? Well, you're, you're asking me, your you, are, you are asking me to interpret well, his comments. Well, the Was Washington would have an assessment on this. Like, uh, is, our, is, our assessment, is closing the door our assessment is that or? Finland and Sweden are ready to join the alliance. Uh, we've made that very clear in public. We've made that very clear uh, in private. Our Congress uh, has made that uh, very clear as well. Uh, uh, yes, Maggie. Yeah, do you have anything for the Asian community regarding the tragic Monterey Park shootings over the weekend? Uh, of course, we all woke um, awoke to the heartbreaking news on uh, Sunday morning. The terrible uh, shooting that took place in, in Monterey Park. Uh, our, just as you heard from President Biden, from the First Lady, uh, our thoughts are with all of those who were killed uh, in this horrific attack, all of those who were wounded uh, in this shooting, those who are uh, still recovering uh, and, and fighting for their lives. Uh, this is an attack, of course, that has been felt across this country. Uh, we know that uh, this is an attack that uh, has, of course, um, been especially devastating uh, for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander uh, community as well. Uh, our thoughts are with uh, the entire community uh, and um, obviously our, our law enforcement partners uh, are, are pursuing this matter aggressively. Can I also ask about U.S.-China uh, cooperation on anti to fight narcotics? When was the last time the two countries talk or had a meeting uh, to talk about combating uh, narcotic, for example, including the illicit effect, fentanyl? And uh, do you expect that to be on the agenda for Secretary Blinken travel to Beijing? When it comes to the agenda for his upcoming travel, I'm going to avoid um, getting into any detail at this point. I suspect we'll have uh, plenty of opportunities to speak to all of you ahead of uh, his travel to the PRC uh, next month. Uh, suffice to say, uh, the Secretary will seek to engage uh, substantively and constructively uh, when it comes to uh, those areas of competition, uh, those areas that uh, have the potential uh, to be conflictual, to see to it that uh, we can prevent competition from uh, veering into conflict, but also uh, those areas where we would like to see cooperation or in some cases deeper cooperation. On that third category, we have a long history of successful cooperation with the PRC on counter narcotics. Uh, it is a uh, threat that is felt mm -hmm. acutely in, in both of our countries and it's also a threat uh, that neither of our countries can address alone. Uh, engagement on this issue has been limited in, in recent months, uh, but we are seeking to re-engage the, the PRC on this issue precisely because it is uh, within that bucket of issues where we feel that we have a responsibility uh, as uh, two great countries to tackle this uh, and to tackle one of the core challenges that we feel acutely here. I made this point the other, the other day, but fentanyl is the leading killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 49. Uh, it's precisely why Secretary Blinken uh, in any number of engagements with his senior team raises uh, the challenge of fentanyl, uh, the need on the part of the State Department to see to it that we're doing everything we can through our bilateral relations, through international bodies, uh, cooperation with the DEA and other uh, departments and agencies in this government uh, to see to it that we're doing everything to uh, address it. Uh, when it comes to the PRC, since the PRC scheduled fentanyl and related substances as a class in 2019, uh, the PRC is no longer a major source of fentanyl flowing to the United States, uh, but we continue to see PRC origin precursor chemicals being used in illicit fentanyl production. Uh, though its past action has helped counter illicit synthetic, synthetic drug flows, uh, we do uh, hope to see uh, additional action from the PRC, uh, meaningful, concrete action to curb the diversion of precursor chemicals and equipment used by criminals uh, to manu manufacture fentanyl and other uh, synthetic uh, drugs. This is a challenge not only within our own two countries, but uh, around the world. Countries around the world uh, expect us uh, to work cooperatively uh, to, to address it. Uh, yes? Thank you. Um, last week, uh, Secretary Blinken spoke with President Lorenzo 
and on the call he highlighted the efforts of President Lorenzo in to, uh, to bring peace in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Can you elaborate a little more on this call and can you give us a view of the State Department on the effort that Angola is making to bring peace to the DRC and what can the U.S. do to help? Sure. Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, the two did have an opportunity to speak on, on January 19th, late last mm -hmm. week. We issued a readout in the aftermath of that call. Uh, but it was an important moment for Secretary Blinken to speak to President Lorenzo about a couple things. Number one uh, was Angola's constructive engagement through the Luanda process, Luanda process, uh, to engage with uh, authorities from the DRC, authorities uh, from Rwanda, to try to bring about an end to this conflict, this needless violence in the eastern DRC. When we were in uh, the DRC and Rwanda over the summer, uh, the secretary uh, spoke uh, in uh, very complimentary terms with high praise about the role that we've seen Angola uh, and other countries play to try and address uh, the disagreements uh, between uh, the DRC and Rwanda uh, and to bring about an end to uh, the bloodshed that has cost uh, far too many lives. Uh, we also have a burgeoning economic partnership with Angola. It was a topic of uh, conversation between the two leaders. Um, the secretary raised the upcoming visit of Amos Hochstein, uh, who is a special presidential coordinator for uh, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure uh, and uh, Investment, something that we are very bullish on uh, as an opportunity to bring uh, additional economic prosperity, um, partnership to uh, countries and places uh, around the world where the United States has not always been uh, the partner of for first resort when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to investment projects, and we hope to see that uh, change. Uh, they also discussed uh, some follow-up matters from the U.S.-Africa uh, Leader Summit. We were very happy to, to welcome the Angolan delegation to Washington uh, in December, and I suspect uh, that we'll continue to see follow-up from other senior officials in this department to their Angolan counterparts in the weeks and months ahead. And can you tell us if there is any upcoming visit from U.S. officials to Angola? Uh, what I can say, yes, uh, what I can say, you, you heard this from President Biden at the conclusion of the U.S.-Africa Leader Summit, that uh, individuals from across this administration, senior individuals from across this administration are going to be spending quite a bit of time on the continent uh, over this year, this coming year. So Angola is one of the countries? Uh, I, I don't have any travel to, to announce today, but whether it's Secretary Blinken, whether it is our ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who just announced uh, an additional trip to uh, the African continent today, the First Lady, the President himself, others, uh, I suspect you will see a number uh, of senior officials from this administration uh, in Africa in the coming months. Can you uh, Dear, Dear Congo briefly? Sure. Um, there is an attack today in the east of the DRC uh, claimed by ISIS. Um, is, uh, just briefly, do you have any reaction to that? How, how much of a concern is there that there could be more ISIS uh, violence? There? We've unfortunately seen ISIS uh, claim a number of attacks uh, in uh, the DRC. Uh, last week, ISIS claimed responsibility for the bombing of a, of a Protestant church in the eastern Congolese town of Kashindi. Killed uh, more than a, a dozen people. It injured uh, dozens more, some 60 people. Uh, we have consistently condemned uh, ISIS DRC for uh, the cowardly attacks, bombings that they've carried out against the civilian population. Uh, in this part uh, of, of the DRC. The fact that they would attack a church uh, makes what they have done uh, especially uh, dastardly and contemptible. Um, our thoughts are, are with the victims, with their loved ones. Uh, uh, those responsible for this uh, must be held to account. And just just very briefly on, on DRC, the, uh, there's a weekend statement, uh, the secretary's call with uh, former Mr. Altani of Qatar, and it mentions mm -hmm. actually talk about DRC. Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific what the Qatari role there that they're looking for? I, there's not much uh, additional uh, I can add on this, but of course our Qatari partners have uh, been useful bridge, bridge builders across uh, any number of uh, challenging issues. Uh, they have uh, helped us 
indispensably uh, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan. They've been a, a force to uh, help uh, create and reinforce uh, regional stability uh, and integration in the Middle East, uh, but they've also played a role that is much further afield, including uh, in the context of uh, the conflict in the Eastern uh, DRC. Uh, Iran. Uh, thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, so, Go ahead. the United Nations uh, Human Rights Representative for Afghanistan released a report today that shows a new high level of uh, human rights violation by the Taliban. In many levels, uh, they torture women, human rights activists, and so on and so forth. So may I ask you uh, which kind of action the United States would take to keep the Taliban accountable? Uh, uh, so far, we have seen that the Taliban asked many things from the United States, and they got it, many of them. Uh, they got money, and also they are flexible, some sort of, but they haven't given anything so far uh, especially the United States asked for, including women's rights. They banned women from universities and they are torturing journalists and human rights activists. So people are asking this question that which kind of uh, action the United States will take to keep them accountable. Sure. I, I just want to be very clear on the, on the premise of your question. Uh, it is certainly not the case that we have provided the Taliban with any support whatsoever. Uh, and in fact, we have uh, gone to great lengths uh, to continue to be the world's leading humanitarian provider to the people of Afghanistan uh, in a way that doesn't flow through the coffers of the Taliban. We prov provided about $1.1 $1 billion uh, worth of humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people, uh, not to uh, the Taliban, not to any uh, entity purporting uh, to represent uh, or to serve as the government uh, of uh, Afghanistan for that very reason. When it comes to the trust fund uh, that we established, we established a trust fund uh, so precisely uh, so that uh, this funding would not be able to be diverted uh, to the Taliban uh, and to use for their own ends. Uh, the, the trust fund, the $3.5 billion uh, in the so-called Afghan fund that we established is for uh, broader macroeconomic stability, again, uh, for the people of Afghanistan, but certainly not uh, to support the Taliban in any way. Much to the contrary, uh, we've been reviewing our approach and engagement with the Taliban in the context of many of uh, the human rights violations, the draconian edicts, uh, the repugnant uh, actions that we've seen from the Taliban in recent weeks and in recent months. Uh, I'm just not in a position to uh, detail uh, where we are in that process, but I can tell you, uh, we are actively evaluating with allies and partners uh, the appropriate next steps. Uh, we've been clear that there will be costs for uh, the Taliban for these actions. Absolutely everything remains on the table, uh, and we're looking at a range of options that uh, will allow us to maintain our position uh, as uh, principal position as the single largest donor of humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan. Again, that's funding that goes directly to the Afghan people, uh, while also doing everything we can uh, to prevent the humanitarian situation from deteriorating uh, even further. Uh, these responses uh, take some time. Uh, they involve significant coordination with our allies, with international partners, uh, and Afghan women themselves. Uh, we have been in touch with uh, senior UN officials as well. There have been uh, delegations from the UN uh, to Afghanistan uh, to investigate uh, the situation and to, uh, to be a constructive uh, force vis-a-vis -vis what we've seen from the Taliban. Uh, but the human humanitarian and the human rights communities, uh, there's no question, are facing extremely difficult options as they strive to help those in dire need while also remaining uh, neutral, impartial, and independent uh, in their provision of support to the Afghan people. Uh, because as a result of these edicts, um, men are um, uh, not allowed to enter uh, women-headed households. NGOs cannot reach most of the most vulnerable inside of Afghanistan, uh, including in women-run households and, and mothers who must maintain adequate nutrition uh, for uh, their newborn babies uh, without female workers present. Um, as of earlier this month, about 83% of organizations operating in Afghanistan had suspended or reduced their operations 
uh, because they came to the conclusion that uh, they could not do their work under these new edicts. This is unacceptable uh, to us, but more importantly to the international community because it imperils uh, some 28 million Afghans who need uh, this humanitarian assistance uh, to survive, and especially uh, women and children, uh, those who are especially uh, vulnerable. So we're firmly committed to helping alleviate the suffering of the Afghan people. And uh, as I mentioned before, we've been the world's leading humanitarian provider, $1.1 billion uh, in assistance since August of, of 2021 uh, to provide critical aid. Uh, and I have no doubt uh, that we'll continue to do everything we can uh, to support the uh, but the, 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 concern, needs sir, of the, yeah, the concern is that the Taliban are getting that money because there is no any clear strategy to give that money to ordinary people and vulnerable people. So the concern is, and there are reports, uh, uh, that Taliban are uh, obviously using that money uh, for their own benefits. This money is not flowing to or through the Taliban. Uh, mm -hmm. It is uh, being administered by NGO partners on the ground, or I should say it has been administered by NGO partners on the ground. And I say has because of the challenge we're facing now. Uh, these draconian edicts on the part of the Taliban, including uh, an edict propagated on uh, Christmas Eve of last year, that NGOs couldn't work with women, uh, had to work with men. Of course, uh, that is an unsustainable um, obligation, restriction on the part of many international NGOs. And we've seen many international NGOs come to the conclusion that they're just not in a position to continue providing this aid uh, to the Afghan people. We're going to do what we can to uh, see to it that these edicts uh, are reversed using the leverage that we have uh, to uh, seek to accomplish that, um, but also uh, to do everything we can to continue to provide humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of these uh, restrictions and edicts. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, uh, John Zebali from Airway News Pakistan. Um, this is about press freedom again. Um, our director news uh, of Airway News, uh, Ahmad Yusuf, is facing criminal charges uh, for just doing his job. He's also being dragged uh, uh, for a tradition case, which can get him a death sentence. Um, we talked about this press freedom many times. Uh, your thoughts on that case? Uh, we, we have discussed it uh, many times, and each time you've heard of the emphasis we place on press freedom around the world. Uh, free press and informed citizenry are key for any nation and its democratic identity, its democratic future, the democratic aspirations of its own people. We routinely raise our concerns about press freedom uh, to governments, to stakeholders all around the world. Uh, when it comes to this particular case, we need to refer you to the government of Pakistan. Sir, Pakistani Prime Minister Sheba Sharif has called uh, for the peace talks uh, with India. He says that uh, he's ready to talk about all the burning issues, including Kashmir, but India rejected that offer, um, saying this is not like, like for the right time to talk about these issues. What are your comments on that? Because you always talk about the peace and stability in the region. Uh, we have, you're right, we've long called for regional stability and. Uh, South Asia, that's certainly what we want to see. We want to see it advanced. When it comes to our partnership, our partnerships with India and Pakistan, uh, these are relationships that stand on their own. Uh, we do not see these relationships as uh, zero sum. They stand on their own. Uh, we have uh, long called for regional stability in, in South Asia, but uh, the pace, the scope, the character of any dialogue between India and Pakistan is a, is a matter for those two countries, India and Pakistan. Uh, yes? Um, with respect to this is Quran burning incident in Sweden, Ned, you used so many words, so many terrible words, like repugnant, disrespectful, disgusting, but for condemning it. What take you from saying that you condemn this act of hatred? And, and even Russians came out in that. I, I'm certainly not refraining from condemning uh, this, this particular act. And as I said before, it's repugnant. Uh, it is something that is uh, vile. Um, of course, countries around the world have, uh, and what we also seek to uphold, uh, are the very democratic principles uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, the right to freedom of assembly, assembly, the right to freedom of expression. I was making the point that we've had uh, at least one high-profile similar incident in this country that was equally repugnant and vile. Uh, 
uh, and that we spoke out uh, against as, at the time, just as we're doing so in the context of uh, what has happened uh, in Sweden, just as our Swedish partners have done. Yes, but at the, at the end of the day, currently, the Turkish public, and of, of course the entire Muslim world, is outraged by this act done under the protection of the police, the Swedish police, and then it has a political pressure on the Turkish leadership with respect to the Swedish bid for NATO. So, do you think that uh, just calling it, yes, some a repugnant, a disrespectful, a disgusting action happened under the auspices of freedom of speech would help in any way to, to, to resolve the, the current deadlock between Turkey and and Sweden with respect to Swedish membership today? Our, our Swedish partners have spoken to this. They have spoken out force, uh, forcefully uh, against it. Uh, the fact of the matter is this was, as I understand it, a private individual, a provocateur, someone who may have deliberately sought to uh, put uh, uh, distance between uh, two close partners of ours, Turkey and Sweden, uh, who may have deliberately sought uh, to uh, have an impact on the ongoing discussion regarding uh, the accession of Sweden and Finland to NATO. This, of course, was not an act of the Swedish government. Uh, this is something that our Swedish par partners have rightfully spoken out against, just as we spoke out uh, against a similar vile act that took place uh, about a decade ago in uh, a previous administration here. Uh, it doesn't, because something happens in a democracy, does not mean that the government supports it. Uh, it is a uh, reflection of the values and principles that we hold dear, including freedom of association, freedom of expression. Something, again, can be lawful and awful at the same time. It's precisely why Sweden has spoken out against it in this case, as we've spoken out against similar examples in the past. Uh, yes, in the past. Yes, Ned, uh, last week I had asked you about Narendra Modi and how the U.S. has compromised on some of its values. And the BBC just released a documentary on Modi on how he had butchered, and the report was just released, it, it was a government report. BBC just released it, it was made by a former secretary, in which he has even mentioned higher number of deaths, higher numbers of women raped, and it was just done right under the nose of Narendra Modi. I don't, I, I, I had never challenged the strategic interest of the US with India, but I regret the fact that since last eight years that I've been covering the State Department, I have not seen once an official standing here at UC condemning Narendra Modi himself individually, not just as a prime minister, but individually his act. And I'm sure the US officials were aware of it as well. I'm not aware of this documentary that, that you point to, but I, what I will say broadly is that there are a number of elements that undergird the global strategic partnership that we have uh, with our Indian partners. Um, there are uh, close political ties, there are economic ties, there are exceptionally deep people-to-people -people ties uh, between the United States and India. Uh, but one of those additional elements are the values that we share, uh, the values that are common to American democracy and to Indian democracy. Uh, India, of course, is uh, the world's largest democracy. It's a, it's a, it's a vibrant uh, democracy. Uh, and again, um, we look to everything that ties us together, uh, and we look to reinforce all of those elements that tie us together. So my yeah. godfather is an Indian as well, by the way. So I have all the respect for India. Don't get me wrong, India. But I just regret the fact that how is it possible <clears> that the State Department officials who were posted there at that time did not know that this individual who's... Uh, as a former chief minister, he is, it, it happened right under his nose. 2,000 people were burned alive. Uh, again, I'm not familiar with the documentary you're uh, referring to. Uh, I am very familiar with the shared values that connect uh, the United States and India as two uh, thriving, uh, vibrant democracies. Uh, when we have concerns about actions that are taken in India, we've uh, voiced those. Uh, we've had an occasion to, to do that. But 
uh, we want first and foremost to reinforce uh, yes. those those values that are at the heart of our relationship. One follow up, but does do you, do you think that such foreign policy has affected President Biden's Indian voters here in the U.S. Though uh, we don't think about it through those terms. I don't think about domestic politics, and uh, yeah. neither does anyone in this building. Yeah, on China, on China. Do you have what is your assessment of the COVID situation in China? Do you have any? Because the figures that are coming from inside China are not said to be not very reliable. Do you have an estimate how many people have died, how many people have been impacted by COVID-19, and has it impacted its aggressive behavior against its neighbors? Um, one, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, want to even speak to uh, the, the toll of COVID uh, inside the PRC. That's a better question for the WHO, for global health authorities. Uh, including those like the WHO who have had an opportunity to sit down with PRC authorities to look at the data. Uh, the point that we have routinely made is that we wish to see uh, transparency from the PRC. We wish to see transparency towards the WHO so that uh, the broader international community can uh, be best prepared uh, to uh, detect and prevent the spread of uh, any new variants that uh, may be circulating and could have the potential to emerge. It's not just a point we have made, uh, but it's a point that the WHO uh, has made as well. Has China asked for any help and assistance from the U.S. in terms of uh, any supplies, medical supplies, or vaccinations? The United States is the world's leading provider uh, of vaccines to countries around the world. Uh, 600 plus million vaccines without any political strings attached uh, that we've provided over the course of uh, nearly the past uh, two years. Uh, we've been very public about the fact that we're willing to provide uh, vaccines to any country uh, that would seek it, that's in need of them. That includes the PRC. Uh, the PRC has publicly said that they appreciate the offer of uh, vaccines, but uh, they're not uh, in need of them uh, at the moment. I have one more question on Pakistan. Uh, there's a massive national grid collapse inside Pakistan. The federal minister has said that even the emergency services are being shut down, like hospitals. I know U.S. has played a big role in Pakistan's power electricity generation. Uh, is U.S. sending someone over there to look into it for a long-term solution to the uh, of, of course, have seen what has uh, transpired in, in Pakistan. Our thoughts are with all those who've been affected by uh, the outages. Uh, the United States, of course, as you mentioned, has uh, assisted uh, our, pa our Pakistani partners uh, across any number of challenges. Yeah. We're prepared to do so in this case if, uh, if there is something that we're able to provide, but I'm not aware of, uh, of any particular request. Yeah. Uh, do you have any update yeah. on the vaccines? Let, let, let me move around to, to yeah. others who haven't gotten a question. Very, very quickly, and uh, Charles, I have a uh, Human Rights Watch uh, issued a report today saying that the new Israeli measures regarding the entry of foreigners into the West Bank uh, threatened to exacerbate the separation of Palestinians <coughs> from the global civil society. Do you have any comment on that? Because uh, they're not allowed, they can go into Israel, but apparently they're not allowed to go into the West Bank. Now in the uh, Said, I haven't seen that particular uh, report. If we do have a comment, we, we, we can get back to you. One other question Israel, uh, regarding Israel. Today, the, uh, the United States and Israel launched one of the biggest exercises that we have ever heard. It's called Juniper Oak, and it combines all forces uh, together. Does that mean that the tension in Iran is split off the table? No, it means that our security uh, commitment to Israel's ironclad uh, and exercises, including military exercises, uh, with our Israeli partners are something that we've done routinely in the past. I would need to refer you to DOD uh, to, to speak to this, but uh, it is a reflection of the vibrant uh, security cooperation and commitment we have to our Israeli partners. Yeah, but there is no secret of the fact that it actually resembles, you know, perhaps an attack on Iran or anything like this. Uh, uh, again, Saeed, we, we, are, we work day in, day out uh, with our Israeli partners to be prepared to confront any number uh, of challenges, uh, but the, what you're referring to uh, is a reflection of that ironclad security commitment yes, that we've one really long had. Okay. Just quickly. The, um, do you have anything to say about there have been ongoing protests in Israel about uh, what's viewed as stacking or, uh, or uh, diluting the power of the Supreme Court? Uh, does the U.S. have anything to say about that and whether this... 
shows respect for judicial independence in the way that the United States would see as consistent with democracy. Well, as a matter uh, in, in terms of our approach, we, we support policies that advance Israel's security and regional integration, support a two-state solution, and lead to equal measures of security, prosperity, and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians. We strongly support uh, freedom of assembly. This includes peaceful protest countries uh, around the world. Of course, that includes uh, inside of uh, Israel's as well. We look forward to working with Israel to advance the interests and values that have been at the heart of our relationship for decades, uh, and that includes the equal administration of justice to all of those who live in Israel. Uh, let me move to people who haven't, yes, in the back. Um, China and human rights, like we have American families, like who have family members that attend in China. Is that like they're calling for negotiations or even prisoner exchange? Is that something the U.S. would consider with the PRC? We have no higher priority uh, than the safety and security of Americans uh, overseas. Uh, of course, you've heard the priority we attach uh, to individuals who are wrongfully detained, who are subject uh, to coercive uh, exit bans. In any country where this is the case, we raise that uh, with local authorities. We raise it when we uh, travel uh, to such countries. We routinely raise it uh, when we uh, dis have discussions uh, with uh, authorities from uh, those countries as well. Uh, that is the case with, uh, in the context of uh, the PRC. It's been a uh, discussion with our uh, PRC and the counter and uh, with our PRC counterparts in the past. I suspect it will be, uh, and I know it will be, uh, a topic of discussion in the future as well. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, today's sanctions against the um, Islamic Republic, along with the um, UK sanctions and EU sanctions, showed a very remarkable unity. But on the same day today, we have a comment from Joseph Borrell about the listing IRGC as a terrorist group. So he said that this cannot be decided without a court, court decision first, and then EU is going to proceed with that. And then he said something interesting. He said, you cannot say, I consider you a terrorist because I don't like you. This is what he said, quote unquote. And also, um, the Islamic Republic foreign minister said that he has assurance from Borel that IRGC is not going to list it as a terror organization. Do you have any comment on this development? We've heard a number of statements from the Iranian foreign minister uh, that are dubious, if not uh, outright lies. Uh, so I would just keep that broader context in mind when you point to statements from uh, the Iranian foreign minister. Uh, when it comes to uh, our European allies, uh, we welcome Europe's strong and principled approach to the IRGC. Uh, as you know, the IRGC remains designated by the United States as a foreign terrorist organization and especially designated global terrorists. Uh, we've also sanctioned many IRGC leaders individually for their involvement in terrorism and human rights abuses. You mentioned the latest tranche of human rights sanctions that we announced in conjunction with many of our closest partners earlier today. Uh, we applaud the EU's recent designations of IRGC officials and entities for their involvement in providing drones uh, to Russia, uh, which are being used to fuel Russia's unconscionable attacks on Ukraine's critical infrastructure. Our European allies recognize uh, the threat, uh, the challenges posed uh, by the IRGC and, and Iran more broadly. Uh, we um, have enjoyed exceptionally close uh, cooperation and coordination with Europe uh, on confronting these challenges. And that his hesitation, Borel's reframing from this, which is very the opposite of what we are hearing from other let's say, uh, parliament members like Germany's um, uh, member at the you know, parliament, European parliament. Um, do you think this hesitation is coming from a hope that he has? I cannot help but wonder, maybe Borrell is still um, hopeful that JCPOA is going to be revived. Can be this can be this a sign of that? Or? I, I couldn't speak to uh, the high representative's comments. In fact, I would refer you to uh, the EU uh, on his comments. Uh, and these are our questions for our European allies. But uh, what is uh, not a question uh, is the JCPOA. We've been very clear that the JCPOA is not on the agenda, has not been on the agenda for months. Uh, Iran has consistently turned its back on opportunities uh, to pursue uh, mutual uh, return to compliance with the JCPOA. 
uh, and as a result of what Iran is doing around the world and to its own people. Uh, we have focused on uh, sending very clear messages to Iran. Stop killing your people. Stop providing uh, drones to uh, Russia for use in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, release the Americans that you were wrongfully detaining. Uh, yeah, Shannon. Same topic. Um, can you say if the U.S. has given the European Union any consult on whether to designate the IRGC? And can you say just would the U.S. welcome, while it's in the hands of the EU, would the U.S. welcome such a designation? Uh, this is a question for the European Union, um, but what I can tell you is that we routinely discuss the challenges and threats posed by the IRGC uh, with allies and partners around the world. And of course, that includes with our European allies bilaterally, but also uh, with the EU as a whole. Uh, there is no illusion uh, in Europe about the challenges or threats that the IRGC uh, poses. We're always looking for ways that we can work with our European allies to counter the malicious activity of the IRGC, other Iranian uh, proxy groups, other groups that uh, Iran has uh, supported. Uh, and we uh, have applauded uh, the recent designations that we've seen from our European allies of IRGC officials uh, and entities for um, their involvement in uh, some of what we've already discussed, Iran's provision of drones to uh, Russia, uh, and uh, as a result of the human rights abuses that we've seen in Iran. Yes, Elizabeth. So, if I could follow up on that. On today's human rights sanctions, do you have any indications that the designations of Iranian officials are having an impact internally, including on the security forces behavior? Uh, it is always difficult to uh, delve into a, um, a hypothetical or a counterfactual like that. Uh, we want to send, and I think we are sending, a very clear message to uh, the Iranian regime, uh, two messages really, that the world is watching uh, and the world is prepared to take action uh, in response to the violence that Iranian officials are perpetrating against their own people. This is not the first round of sanctions that we've announced against uh, Iranian officials in response to the protests that we've seen in Iran since uh, late last year. Uh, if Iran continues to engage in these human rights abuses, uh, we will continue to apply even uh, more pressure uh, on Iran. Uh, but of course, this is about human rights. We have other concerns with this uh, regime. Uh, and we are uh, going to use every relevant and appropriate authority uh, to hold it account on the various fronts, from human rights to its provision uh, of UAV technology uh, to Russia, uh, to the challenges that are posed by uh, its nuclear program, to uh, its support for uh, terrorist groups and proxies as well. Uh, yes? Uh, Kosar Javed, Bol News, Pakistan. Former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Haza, has said he wanted to establish good relations with the United States of America. As we know, many things happened in the past. If we get elected uh, as a Prime Minister of Pakistan, what would, would you open the door for uh, talk to him and his party? Uh, we are, uh, of course, open to uh, and, and would work uh, with any elected government in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is a partner of ours. We share a number of uh, interests. Uh, we have demonstrated our uh, desire to see uh, constructive relations with Pakistan over the course of successive governments. Uh, as we have said in, in different contexts, uh, we judge governments by the policies they pursue. Uh, it would ultimately be a question uh, of the type of policy that any future government of Pakistan might pursue. Uh, Alex. Thanks so much. A quick follow-up on Wagner. I also have another question on the second. It's called to us of John. Um, I'm having trouble understanding the administration's strategy on, first of all, going uh, with the TCO designation uh, instead of FT, the FTO, which we discussed uh, last week on uh, terrorist organization. And um, if the intention here is to go after the business, why announce your intention on Friday and not taking action until this week? Why aren't we galloping against the time here? Uh, so a couple things on that, Alex. One, uh, as I said before, we're reaching for every appropriate uh, and effective authority when it comes to countering the activity that uh, the Wagner Group is engaged in. Uh, these authorities are not authorities that we've created ourselves. Also, oftentimes they are uh, legislated, they are written into law uh, with uh, various 
requirements that any particular group would have to meet, whether that's the transnational criminal organization authority, whether that's a state sponsor uh, authority, whether that is uh, any authority that we've attached to terrorist organizations, criminal organizations, uh, or or <clears throat> otherwise. Uh, when it comes to what we announced about uh, our forthcoming plans for uh, the Wagner Group, um, the activity that we've seen on the part of the Wagner Group uh, allows us to meet that threshold that is established under the Transnational Criminal Organization uh, Authority. It is um, engaging in activity out of a pursuit of, in some ways, uh, profit, in some ways, prestige. Uh, it is uh, employing officials who are criminals. In some cases, uh, its subordinates include those who have been released from prison, uh, where they have been serving uh, long sentences for uh, the uh, for committing violent crimes. Uh, so we look to the authority and the requirements that we have to meet. In this case, uh, we're confident that we're able to meet it. Uh, in the case of uh, Wagner's status as a transnational uh, criminal organization, um, it provides us another tool to hold uh, the Wagner Group, its senior officials, uh, and its uh, employees to account. Uh, we'll have more to say on uh, a broader set. Uh, of actions that we're taking later this week. I don't want to get a, a ahead of that, uh, but uh, we are confident that this is an appropriate step given what we've seen from the Wagner Group. Thank you. My next topic. I, I, need, I, need, to, I, need, to, I need to move on, Alex. Yes. Uh, one, uh, one question on Lebanon and the other on Russia. On Lebanon today, the judge uh, investigating, investigating Beirut last resumed his work and he made charges against senior officials. Some of them are your allies and have been in the States before a few months ago. Do you have any comment on that? And my second question is on Russia, the uh, downgrading relation, uh, diplomatic relation with Estonia. Do you, do you expect similar behavior from the Russian, from Putin against other NATO members? Uh, if you're referring to the decision on the part of uh, Baltic states to downgrade, downgrade uh, their relations with Moscow, these are sovereign decisions on the part uh, of, of uh, uh, our partners. We would defer to them uh, as to determine uh, the level of diplomatic representation, if any, uh, that is appropriate uh, with Russia. Uh, when it comes to Lebanon, uh, we in the international community have made it clear since the explosion that we support swift, uh, that we support and urge Lebanese authorities to complete a swift and transparent investigation into the horrific explosion at the port of Beirut. Uh, the victims of this explosion in August of 2020 deserve justice. Uh, those responsible must be held uh, accountable. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, go ahead. Um, I have a question now. I see this statement uh, that you continue the talks with uh, Turkey on the F-35 program. And I'm wondering uh, if something changed, because uh, the last uh, we knew was that Turkey is under cuts as actions for buying the Russians, uh, the Russian system S-400. Why do you talk That's about right. That's right. Nothing has changed uh, in terms of Turkey's eligibility for the F-35 program. DOD did issue a statement. This is a discussion regarding uh, how to wind down uh, elements of, of, of that uh, program. All right. Thank you all very much. Good day.